Beth, thank you so much for being with us on Zoom. And thank you to the others of you who have come through Zoom. Um, it's a different format this week than what we have been doing, but we decided with um, COVID rearing back up just for a little bit, we would um, shift venues and, and have a, a Zoom meeting tonight. So this is our final study in our Christmas series. And this one is focusing on Epiphany. And so, Beth, we welcome you and thank you. Look forward to where you'll take us. Yes. Well, and I just want to thank you, Anna, and also River Road for inviting me into your space <laughs> with a zoom into your Zoom space. <laughs> uh, but I, I've I've enjoyed this and I've enjoyed the conversations um, that not only with you, Anna, at the beginning, but then the ones we've been able to have uh, you know across the weeks. So the title that I have for this session is Risking Hospitality, Following a Star. And before we got into Epiphany and the biblical story that's going to shape how we move this week, I wanted to just lift up uh, three things that I have emphasized um, thus far in our study of hospitality. And the first is untamed, <laughs> um, which I, I think I, I told y'all that was the, actually not the, the title the, uh, the publishers gave or the editors gave to my book, um, but one I have certainly come to really embrace. And it's meant to convey that God's hospitality um, often, more often than not goes against our quote unquote normal expectations of what hospitality should look like. And that first um, session I talked about sort of the hospitality that we think of as being polite or being nice or that we see in Southern living. And God's hospitality is radically different than that. Um, and we see that perhaps most fully in God's presence in the least of these that, um, in ways that we don't expect, Matthew 25. The second was the extravagance of hospitality. And I mentioned that point, particularly when we looked at Mary, because here you have someone who is this humble Jewish maiden, and she is told that she will give birth to the Son of God. And there's a kind of um, unfathomableness there to that, not really even knowing what that meant. But as it unfolds, and as, as we know, the whole Christianity unfolds, it's this extravagant gesture, extravagant love of God that comes into the world in Christ and in the body of Christ. And then the third was hidden. And uh, we talked about that, particularly with the shepherds who are, of course, these peasants in the field, and they are the ones that um, are told by the angels to go to the stable. But, you know, from, from the reader's perspective, of course, we know that something else is going on. But, um, you know, if you're in the context, there is a hiddenness there that no one really quite knows what this is. So I wanted us to keep these in mind then as we come into the story of Epiphany. And I'm going to move y'all because you're covering up my words. <laughs> okay, Wee, you go over here. Okay. Uh, uh, so let me just read a few verses Ooh, okay. <laughs> from, uh, from the story of Epiphany. And uh, I imagine you've already heard these um, this week. And of course, before as well. But I want to just lift up parts of the story again. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And coming together, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired to them where the Messiah was to be born. Can we skip ahead a little bit? When the wise men saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, 
they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. And um, to connect this before we move into our, our new segment here about hospitality and risk, I uh, wanted to say again, I think we see in this story these uh, hospitality as untamed, as extravagant and hidden. And first, this is you know, God's hospitality, which of course we're called to imitate, but God's hospitality is untamed because here you have um, the story of God speaking to three Persian kings, right? Completely, you know, out of nowhere. And really, um, what is often said about this passage is here it's made very clear that the savior is coming not only for the people of israel but for the whole world for all nations and so you have them you know, you have god you know, expanding this and uh you see an extravagance here as well um and, and at the same time there's there's a hiddenness in the sense of course at the literal level that the kings themselves are afraid for their own lives and are seeking to hide from herod and I think, again, the hiddenness of um, these great wise men coming to this, to this little child. Um, and what, what is it that is here? They don't fully know yet, but they trust that the light is leading them to the Messiah, even though they don't know what this looks like. So I want to move in today to looking at uh, risking hospitality. And um, there are three aspects then that I want us to consider uh, when we think about risk. One is courage, that risk requires courage. The second is that risk requires sacrifice. And the third, um, that risk involves a witness, our witness. And I think just to give kudos to Anna, I think our conversation, I had written those three things down. So uh, that grows out of a conversation we had together. Let me just ask you, when you hear the word courage, what are some words or images that come to your mind? Hmm. To be honest, the first thing that, that pops in my mind is physical. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's not moral courage that pops in my mind immediately. <laughs> just... The thing I think of is combat and army and, yeah. and fighting. Yeah. That's what pops in my mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I know so that's the, not the answer you, that we want to get to. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a long answer. No, uh, but, but the soldier, uh, I mean, yeah. and, and really, um, you know, the courage, because there is a sense of willingness to put your life on the line um, that, that is certainly a part of, of, of a soldier going into combat. You could think of it in terms of parenting. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> you want to say a little bit more about that? <laughs> um, it, it takes courage to bring children into the world. It mm -hmm. takes courage to um, to put your best foot forward, trying to to take care of them and raise them, mm -hmm. and definitely courage as you release them to the world even though it's kind of a forced courage you don't get a right. lot of choice they because they uh, you want that for them too but right but um you realize as they walk out into the world that that's right. part of you going right yeah it's it's um yeah a lack of courage to to sort of want to just to protect your children all the time really you then you're not being courageous in sense of a lot of trusting them to, to go forward okay well accounting in the cost and venturing into the unknown anyway okay okay so counting the cost yeah the unknown i think that part too yeah bert that's really um very key as well when I think of scripture, I think of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego mm -hmm. as those who who did just what Bert said. Mm -hmm. Right. And and were will, willing to pay the price for their convictions. Right. Right. Very good. 
Well, let me let me go back, and I want to um, I want to share a story of courage. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to my screen here. Before I, I sort of say a little bit more about this story of courage, um, and I, I am relating this also to the wise men as well, because they uh, I think to pick up on some of what y'all mentioned, uh, they were willing to go into the unknown um, and trust. God, they went into sort of enemy territory with Herod, um, but were but were willing to to be faithful in any case. And Aristotle has defined courage as a means between two extremes. So on one extreme is foolhardiness. That's the kind of rational, you know, like just rushing into something without really using wisdom to discern the situation. So that, you know, that's on one side. Uh, then the other or the other extreme is of course cowardice, which we're more, you know, more familiar with. We just, you know, we uh, lose, lose nerve and um, sort of, you know, fail, fail to really step into from a Christian perspective, you know, step into where God is calling us. So, you know, so he says both of those are, are, are different from what genuine, you know, genuine courage is. Um, and the other thing that um, that Aristotle emphasizes, and this is picked up in the Christian tradition as well, is that courage is a virtue. And so when we say virtue, one of the meanings of virtue is it's a habit. So Aristotle, and you see this also, you know, in, in uh, throughout the tradition of the saints as well, you know, someone doesn't just randomly become courageous. You, you become courageous by doing what a courageous would, person would do in a, you know, as a, as a courageous person would do it. <laughs> so it's a habit. And I think that's really important when we think about hospitality, because it's not that it's just suddenly, you know, something we're going to do over here and, oh, we're going to go be hospitable in this you know, great way. And then we're going to recede back into ourselves. But it's something that you do daily, and the more you practice courage, the more you become a courageous person. And so the goal is really not just to have hospitality, something external to ourselves, but to become the kind of person who is actually hospitable and welcoming God in our lives and in the presence of others, uh, who comes through the presence of others as well. Okay, so I wanted to just say a little bit about this, um, this story, which I think is a, a story of courage and a story of hospitality. And it's about this village in uh, Les Chambon. And let me just ask, have any of you heard of this by any chance? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, so it's really, there have been documentaries about Les Chambon um, and about Magda and Andre Chakme. Um, if you want to find out more about them, you can go to YouTube. But this was a village that during World War II, um, across a period of time, hid 5,000 Jewish children. And there were about 5,000 villagers. Most of the villagers were Huguenot Protestants. And uh, Andre was the pastor of the village and, and Magda is the wife and also was a leader in this. Um, it's just a remarkable story because one of the things about it, it wasn't like planned or orchestrated where, you know, all the families in the, in the village said, oh, we're going to do this. It was basically the Christians on their own living out the gospel. And they came to the conclusion that they needed to hide these children. So um, some people have called it a conspiracy of love. It wasn't like an organized conspiracy. And I want to let me just go scoot ahead for a second, because uh, Andre was very instrumental in, in the leadership of the community. Uh, and this is from a sermon where he says tremendous pressure will be put on us to submit passively to a totalitarian ideology. The duty of Christians is to use the weapons of the spirit to oppose the violence that they will try to put on our consciences. We shall resist whenever our adversaries demand of us obedience contrary to the orders of the gospel. We shall do so without fear, but also without pride and without hate. So 
I used to show a documentary actually to my uh, students and it was called The Weapons of the Spirit. Because um, uh, Andre was a pacifist. And when he came into the village, that was very much a minority position. And I think even when they decided to harbor the children, they weren't necessarily thinking we are pacifist. It was more like, this is how we're supposed to respond. So, um, yeah, let me see, I've written down a few. You know, one time uh, Magda in this one article, she was asked, you know, how, how, why did you do this? And her response was, well, that, you know, that's like asking, why do, why do you breathe? You know, we, we just did it. <laughs> it's like, so it's an interesting to just think about that from the perspective of habit. Others in the village, you know, cited the gospel and said, you know, Jesus told us to help the stranger. And the, Jew, the Jews right now are the stranger in dire circumstances. Um, so the Vichy authorities, you know, the French uh, who were co uh, cooperating with the, with the Nazis, they had warned the truck maze that uh, if they didn't give them a list of the Jews being hidden in the village, they would be arrested. And truck may refused and then when the SS came to the parsonage to arrest Tim, Magda invited the startled Nazis into the dinner table to eat first. Afterwards, when the officers left with the pastor, the congregation had gathered in front of the house to sing, a mighty fortress is our God. When some of the villagers criticized Magda for inviting the Nazis to dinner, she replied, what are you talking about? It was dinner time. <laughs> so, um, but he was later released and he simply then returned and continued the work. Um, and there were, there were a few people though that I think uh, his nephew actually was, was at one point uh, rounded up and killed. Um, so anyway, it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful story. And um what I wanted us to, I want uh, the question I had is, do you think they were being uh, foolhardy in their actions? Hmm. I don't think foolhardy. Um, risky, yes. <laughs> I mean, they, they calculated the risk, knowing mm -hmm. that that behavior would could could lead to their death, but I don't think that they um, did it without understanding and, right. and and being willing. Right. Yeah. So I think Anna that yeah. So part of what you're adding to Aristotle here, I think, is right um, in terms of um, that being courageous involves calculating or having some sense of what the risk is but going ahead anyway and and saying okay I'm willing to take the risk is that right mm -hmm. I think they had God courage I mean you have to have a big relationship with God to be right. be courageous enough to do stuff like that right yeah like that's like amazing you know right right yeah I was headed in the same direction. Um, I had a childhood friend who uh, picked up his family and his, his wife and his two preschool daughters and went somewhere in the mid Middle East. Um, can't remember which country. This was back in the 90s. Um, War-torn country uh, as, a, as, as a Christian missionary. And it wasn't even with the uh, foreign mission board. I don't know what organization he, he went with or through. Mm -hmm. And people at our church thought he was just crazy. <laughs> and thought he was needlessly endangering his daughters. Yeah. Uh, and when he came back uh, after a year or two over there, he said, I felt safer there in the hand of God than I do here in Charlottesville. Oh, interesting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, uh, Scott, I'm reminded this is um, just a little bit, I guess it relates to courage, but I remember uh, Stanley Harawas and Will Willimon in their book, Resident Aliens, they have a statement in there about no ethic is worthy to, that does not require the suffering of those we love. Um, 
I mean, so the, you know, the family, even though they end up feeling safer, but initially, you know, they're, they're saying, well, this is, I'm drawing my family into this. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, there's this, there's this higher good for which they're saying, not, you know, I'm willing to, I'm willing to risk myself and my family. I mean, that's, you know, that could, that's especially hard, I think, um, a challenge. It makes, it makes me think about those missionaries in Haiti who were kidnapped. Right. Because I know I, you know, I tried not to be judgmental, but then I kept, I know in my mind, I kept thinking about them taking their young children into that environment. Right. So I think that's a perfect discussion of were, were they being foolhardy to live out their convictions? And I mean, right. we know the people of Haiti need so much. Right, help. right. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Honestly, I don't know what I would do in those <laughs> situations or, or right. the people who jump off bridges into into, you know, deep water to rescue toddlers, you know, and and right. and, and are successful sometimes and sometimes they die. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know what right. what makes a person that courageous or is it foolhardy? I don't know. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it is really difficult. Yeah, I think the thing about the child, you know, that your own child, particularly, you know, it's a, it's more of a, you know, in some ways you can say, well, I could risk my life, but do I want to risk my child's? I think the thing one of, that with going back to the village of Les Chambon, the people, you know, they didn't like jump into the risk. They, they were met with a situation initially when they had just a few children coming into the village. And they they sort of opened their homes and they realized that this was how God was leading them. It would it was small steps. And then of course they got into a position where they were actually taking much larger steps and hiding um you know hiding children. But when they were interviewed, you know, it was it was it was just interesting because they were like, well, it didn't really seem like a risk. I mean, it, was, it, it didn't to them. I mean, I remember this one elderly, um, and the, the husband had been hiding the papers for the people in his beehives. And, yeah, you know, he's like, well, this is just sort of what we did. I mean, it didn't, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it, to go back to the idea of, it became a habit where they didn't really feel like they could do otherwise. So it wasn't like they had to sit there and objectively say, oh, should we or not? It was more like they had gotten in and they had, you know, caring and loving the Jewish children. And then they thought, well, yeah, this will, we'll keep doing this. Um, the courage. Yeah. I mean, I, I've just one other comment here that you guys have already referred to when you talked about God courage. Yeah, the, we understand the virtues in light of the stories we live by. And so, for example, you know, the ancient Greeks would have had a certain understanding of virtue that differed in many ways from the Christian understanding. I mean, a certain understanding, excuse me, of courage that would differ in some ways from a Christian understanding of courage. So when y'all talked about God courage, I think you were saying, you know, how do we narrate what courage looks like? And uh, I think here certainly, uh, one of the verses that was also important to this community, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So that, that idea of friendship and being willing to lay down one's life, um, certainly a part of courage. Okay, well, let me go to the next um, emphasis. So risk involving courage and risk the second one is risk involving sacrifice when we think about the wise men um what were they willing to sacrifice herod's acceptance for one thing and his his uh pleasure in what they had done and he's a powerful person so um the, there's risk involved there of well first of all his power against them but also his power for them i would think is something that they might have gotten so rose i, I think it cut off a little bit in my, what you were saying so the sacrifice was 
um, was in relation to Herod. Is that right? Yes, by not yeah. going back to Herod and reporting. Yeah. Right. They risked um, him coming after them, but also yeah, I would yeah. think that when you have a powerful mm -hmm. person like that, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a pat on the back and a, you know, a little political clout to have Herod on your side. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So a sort of political sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not, not getting the, not getting the, well, not only not getting the approval, but actually becoming an enemy. Um, on the other side of what, you know, the nation state or whatever, what was it nation states then, but empire. Yeah, so um, political sacrifice. Good. It's the fear of the unknown because they didn't know where they were going to go. I mean, what, okay. where this is going to lead to, what would happen when we got there, you know. Right, just, right. right. I guess kind of like going to outer space or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, just not sure about where you'll be. Yeah, and um, yeah, and that really that relates to the one that I had down, um, which was the le the sacrifice of sort of leaving their comfort zone, leaving leaving, um, you know, where they are familiar with. I mean, they, of course, they were they were, you know, royalty in a sense in Persia, but they sacrificed that to go to a strange land and um, and to the unknown, like you said. Um, this probably so, wasn't a trip either. This was a big sacrifice. I mean, this was a sacrifice of a decent portion of time, I would suspect. Right, right, yes. They weren't traveling by some fast car. No, right. <laughs> In a good while. Right, yeah. They also yeah. left some pretty expensive bling dropped it off uh, with a peasant couple uh, with a baby yeah you know that's 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 pretty extravagant stuff yeah right the material material sacrifice yeah so political material geographical temporal um and and i think really yeah i mean and and this idea of god calling uh, calling people you know to leave where they are and to go to someplace unknown, that kind of is, that's a pattern throughout scripture. So with Abraham, I mean, God calls Abraham um, and there's a kind of sacrifice involved there because he's sacrificing the security of his land, of his home, of the politics, if you want to say that he's used to, of his material possessions to some extent and to go to a place unknown. Um, so, yeah, so I think then um, hospitality involves um, leaving our comfort zone and sacrificing that in order to go to where God wants us to go. Um, and um, it doesn't have to be as you guys I'm sure know, it doesn't have to be necessarily geographical. It can simply be whatever comfort zones we might have and God's calling us to leave those. Um, so what might, can, can we name some of those, what those comfort zones might be? Um, maybe not particularly for ourselves, but just, just generally perhaps, what are some ways that God's hospitality, God's invitation might call us to sort of move out a bit <laughs> when it would maybe be easier to stay put. <laughs> well, it can be sort of an introvert extrovert thing. Sometimes um, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to go in my little cave and stay there and not come out. And um, yet I know that there's a, there's a ministry often waiting uh, that I that I might ignore just because it, it can be really comfortable not to not to reach out right in hospitality right, right. yes yeah that's good there, there are yeah. also views that we probably feel compelled to express that we know when we do it not everybody shares them but we feel like right. we have to speak up on behalf of others or on behalf of some issue even though mm -hmm. we know some other people are not going to like what what we write or speak Right. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. 
and then and then the sacrifice there too uh when people don't like that but what what is being sacrificed like what is a person oh, if they well, get we're sacrificing uh, our need for approval yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. and um right. maybe popularity or who knows right. yeah. maybe your job Acceptance. even i mean yeah yeah a lot that's right a good word. yes yeah yes no i think there is yeah very good and Bert, don't most of us avoid conflict so we're giving right. up peaceful yeah. Um, right. uh, a superficial peacefulness right mm -hmm. yeah the superficial right that's very good so i think that i don't know how many of y'all were at the very first session when i referred to flannery o'connor's story a good man is hard to find and the grandmother was all about being nice you know and that is a bit so niceness in her sense you know can be just very superficial wanting to wanting to keep everybody uh, sort of appeased um in a way really that actually prevents you from speaking truthfully in love. I mean, so there's a real contrast there between sort of going along and being nice versus being willing to, to sort of speak truthfully. Um, yeah, I think uh, very much, I've very much have felt, you know, I want to be liked, you know? <laughs> so the, the sacrifice of um, not, you know, at least trying to put that a little bit back here and faithfulness more in front. So, yeah, I think what the, the question I had in terms of, um, I think I've already answered it actually, um, but it was, it was the more sentimental views or sort of domesticated views of hospitality. How is hospitality as a sacrifice, a challenge to those views? Um, so, you know, the diminished hospitality is just um, the sort of comfortable, cozy, let's invite the friends we love and know and who agree with us into our homes. <laughs> you know, that's the sort of diminished hospitality. So how is hospitality as a sacrifice, you know, a, a, an alternative to that? Or how have I put it here? A challenge, a challenge to that. Oh, and there was hospitality. Okay, sorry, I forgot to show you my picture there. But okay, so. This was what we just talked about. <laughs> the wise men leave the comfort of their home and travel to another land. And then we talk, you know, where else in scripture? Really, that's an ongoing uh, pattern. And there, yeah, there's a Baptist theologian uh, by the name of James McClendon. I don't know if y'all have heard of him, but um, anyway, he's really uh, from the latter part of the 20th century, he sort of draws a lot from the Anabaptist, but he has a whole long discussion in his book about how early Baptists picked up on this whole idea of Christians being a people of the way. And so it's already within the, within the grammar of that language, this idea that we're on the move, we're, we're leaving one place and going to another. So I just think it's very powerful. Yeah, Baptist uh, sort of connection there. Okay, so risking hospitality witness. And I've written here, some could have said, you know, to the wise, what a waste of effort, money, and time. Um, because, you know, I mean, again, from the outside, it looks like they making a, you know, very costly trip across a lot of terrain. And I imagine, and as you said earlier, it took them a lot of time. I'm sure scholars have calculated what the time was. Um, you know, to, to make this trip, you know, based on a sign that they don't even quite know what the sign means, um, or, I mean, they're, they see it as reliable, but, you know, again, you would have to sort of wonder in their situation, where are they, are they going on a journey, you know, it's really not, not efficient, <laughs> not efficient. Um, okay, so I've asked here, you know, what is their witness? And um, how, might, how might you respond to that? What is their witness? Well, we're still talking about them 2,000 years later. Right. So, um, <laughs> right, yeah. They didn't do it for that purpose, but, yeah, right. you know, it seems to have worked out. Right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, they're still around, yeah. <laughs> 
they also gave legitimacy to Jesus and to his birth and yeah. his role as the son of God. That, yeah. that witness continues to live on. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting word, Rose, legitimacy. But yeah, I think it's a really accurate one because it was, again, God working through a number of venues in order to, um, you know, in order to allow the word to speak most fully. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's good. I was thinking about the context of that story uh, in, in the gospel it, where you're told who's the king and who's the tetrarch and who's every, you know, you get all the, I don't know if that's the way we they dated things, right. but I think there's some method in that madness of talking about all of the political leaders of the day, military and political leaders, and then you have these wise guys, you know, come from the east, and everybody is set in this context of Jesus is born mm -hmm. in the midst mm -hmm. of all of that, and they come and bring gifts and acknowledge mm -hmm. that he is in some way superior to them. Yes. Yeah. And right, I, yeah. that is, you know, you were talking about speaking to power. Yeah. And I, I think that whole context in the yeah. gospel is yeah. here's a baby born that yeah. others acknowledge whether they like it or not. This right. is one to be feared or revered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. Yeah. Very nicely stated. And I mean, yeah. And the, the three roles, you know, usually identified with Jesus through scripture and then you see this also in christian tradition jesus as prophet priest and king and so he's he's king from the get-go i mean he doesn't become king you know here is um you know here is the, yeah the king is born right? so here is here is uh you know the divine son of god uh whose royalty exceeds anything on earth Um, I wanted to pick up on um, this idea of um, a waste of effort, money, and time. And, um, and Anna, I'm going to come back because your comment I thought earlier where you, were, you said this took a lot of time. And one of the things that... Um, that is often said about scripture and, you know, just about the way God works in the world is that, you know, God is not in a hurry. You know, God take God, God takes God's time. Right. Cause, and, you know, if you, and there's some wonderful statements about this that I've quoted in my book um, where, you know, with Abraham, I mean, you know, God is very patient and, you know, in Romans, we even read that God is being very patient now with the, uh, you know, with the divisions in the world. I mean, the divisions between Jews and Gentiles and the divisions within Gentiles because God's hope is that people will turn to him. But their God is not uh, in a hurry. And I think that's so crucial with hospitality too because um, in our purpose-driven lives, <laughs> you know, we, you know we, we can, if we pull that into hospitality, then we will easily distort it because hospitality isn't necessarily about achieving a goal. Um, you know, it's first of all about being present um, and allowing God's grace to be present through us and, and you know, with us and then receiving it from others. I tell this story in, the, in my book, let me just get my, my page here, um, about uh, hospitality as wasting time. And I sort of was picking up on a book by Marva Dawn called, where she, I, I'm not going to get the title exactly right, but she refers to worship as a royal waste of time. Because, <laughs> you know, you, got, you don't get anything done necessarily in worship, I mean, from a, from a secular perspective. Um, but uh, so uh, let me just read this. It's a story about myself. Um, one of the common assumptions about hospitality is that it is primarily about doing something and getting certain results. I once was a board member of an organization that advocated for people with mental handicaps. And occasionally I visited our clients 
even though I'd come to think of myself as a welcoming person, <laughs> I remember on one such visit to a severely handicapped person, and I was actually, I was in the, um, I mean, this person was very, very, I, I don't even know if they, you know, very handicapped. Um, and I was thinking, why am I here? This person can't even tell that I am in the same room. What difference could my being possibly make? Though I'm not happy to admit it, I saw the person in the bed in terms of usefulness. Since my time was not bringing results, it seemed a waste. Um, and so anyway, I just use that then to, 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 think, to, to help us think more deeply about what is hospitality in terms of what is, what is, it, what is our witness here when we're thinking about our practice of hospitality in a world that is so driven by, you know, measuring people based on what they can do or what they can achieve. Um, and so let me just have you guys speak a little bit more to that. And the question I have is, how is, um, how is hospita the witness of hospitality different from uh, being efficient? How is the witness of hospitality, you know, different from being efficient? Mary and Martha, a good illustration. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love that. That's that story. Um, Burr, I'm sure as you know, so many uh, theologians across the tradition have written about that. And um, what and and Teresa of Avila, one of she's from the 16th century. She writes about that, and what she says is that, you know, that the Lord needs both. <laughs> I mean, even though in Scripture Mary is the one that is is sort of held up a little more in higher esteem, but but she really says our Lord needs both in terms of you know sort of doing the service, but also sitting at, at the feet. So. Um, yeah. So, Bert, are you saying, though, that you have to have some efficiency in hospitality? Oh, sure. I'm just, just saying they're a nice study in each. Yeah. In uh, each. There is efficiency, and then they're sitting at the feet. But you don't eat if everybody sits at the feet, and you don't learn anything if everybody's yeah. in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So somebody, somebody's got to do the, the cooking and uh, exactly. to put it on the table. <laughs> Do we want to speak of achievement when we talk about hospitality? I don't think the measure is the same. Okay. I think about the lady who, the woman who broke the perfume over Jesus's feet and everybody was so upset with her. Right. And even though Jesus spoke on her behalf, I'm not sure that anybody ever understood what she did. <laughs> you know, um, it was, it, oh, yeah. it was a gift that God understood. Right. But it wasn't, but it didn't matter in the big scheme of things right. Right. if everybody else got it or not. Right. Um, yeah. So it, it, it was still a witness to her, to her faithfulness and her love. Right. And her devotion and, and sacrifice. Right. Even if people don't understand it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah, that's, that's really... Yeah, hospitality. I mean, yeah, hospitality. And I think the stories of hospitality, I mean, like Les Chambon, I mean, certainly can be misunderstood. I mean, others can say, what in the world? You know, why are they doing this? Um, and I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just say, sometimes I think um, we don't always know at the time right. the impact that right. things are being done have. Right. And they're not measurable at the moment right. and right. sometimes it can be years later right. before someone finds out that something they did made a difference to somebody right. because they did they were reaching yeah. out and being hospitable or yeah in that effort to, right to be kind or whatever right yeah that's a great point yeah no we don't i think um yeah ho i mean we don't know um i mean in hospitality i think has to hold as we become hospitable people, we we trust that God is working in ways that we cannot always see or imagine. Um, 
and and the story it's funny Anna, because i had that story uh i did have that in my notes the story of the woman or, uh, this thing and i skipped over it so, <laughs> so you're right like, but uh, yeah there's something there that's so powerful about how uncalculating mm -hmm. the woman was in showing her love for christ so i think that idea that was a witness that you know we we don't i mean we do want to calculate the cost in a sense i, I know we used that word earlier uh, when we were talking about courage but but her love was uncalculating she, i mean it, it did look like a waste you know a waste from a certain perspective um uh i was going to uh lift up in terms of witness um and i know we've talked before in our sessions about the witness of the saints but in terms of just time um i wanted to lift up polycarp <laughs> and um let me move y'all over here a second um and i've always loved this um so he was very very early in the church um and no. knew john so, and and apparently knew john from who you know john who the author of revelation from, you know and um but here he's brought up during this time of persecution and commanded to deny Christ. And so he says, 80 and six years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? Bring forth what thou wilt. And I think that um, those words just encapsulate the whole theme really from tonight because in terms of courage you know, sacrifice and witness um you know his willingness to sacrifice even his own life but it's not as if he had to think about it you know? <laughs> i mean he had become the kind of person uh the kind of uh christian who was faithful to christ that this is simply who he was and embody that to the very end um but it took time. I mean, 80, you know, 80 and six years. So it was this long process of becoming a witness um, to Christ. Okay, well, um, I did have one more question here. Maybe we'll just um, sort of, um, uh, this is sort of for you to ponder. If anyone wants to speak to it here in the last minutes, you can how do you what i mean so what do you see as challenges and or opportunities for practicing hospitality today <laughs> we're living in a pretty contentious time yeah. let's just say we have probably more opportunities than we ever have <laughs> right yeah And I think part of that is, um, yeah, I mean, loving, loving the other or whatever, or the loving the one with whom we disagree. I think that's really, um, ex you know, not adding to the divisiveness by, you know, alienating others. I think with part of that. I think, you know, I think we, we self segregate as it is, mm -hmm. um, in our, in our, um, in all of our practices, where we live, where we shop, where we eat, right. where we exercise, right. what we read. Um, and it's, um, a challenge to, um, to not be in that insular bubble. Mm -hmm. And sadly, the way you break out of that bubble, one of the ways you break out of that bubble is through technology and that's and that's the worst way of doing it right becoming, a, becoming what we call keyboard warriors right yeah no that's a good point yeah technology is a whole other issue um because we want to affirm the the good things that technology makes possible but then also be very aware of how it can disconnect us in ways certainly or those algorithms that just drive us further and further down the path we've already chosen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. What you what you see? What flips up on your screen? I think that the next generation is going to be more at ease with being hospitable. 
I mean, they, they're going to be, I think, more hospitable without regard to the things that we think that hold us back. I, I don't know. I just feel the promise and what they're doing. I mean, I want to be a part of that solution for sure, but right. I think it's harder for me than it is for the younger people. Yeah. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Well, I have a prayer here, so let me click on that. And, um, I'll, and before I close out my PowerPoint, I'll move you Okay. Um, so I had in mind us saying this together, and you can either mute yourselves or not, whichever you prefer. <laughs> okay, so let us pray. Gracious God, the star that led the Magi to the stable announced to the world that its savior was born. Today, we live in a world that is still covered by darkness and still needing to make that journey to the stable door. May our lives reflect your light day by day as we seek to serve where you have placed us, that we might be the means through which others can encounter Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Beth, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Very thoughtful and, um, and given us a lot of things to consider on each particular evening. Yeah, good. And I do especially like this one. Yeah, good. Very good. Yes, risk. That's just a fun because I think um, that's always a challenge. I think, yeah, it's a challenge to me. Where are the places in my life that I can be more courageous? Okay. <laughs>